Dit is Maria. Je yes, staat is Hester. En samen zijn wij de Concert Counselors. In the Renaissance and the Baroque periods, many musicians wrote instruction books and manuals on music. They are very important sources of information on the performance practice and also the way that our instrument, for example, was taught in the past. And they are full of useful tips and inspiring ideas. So we will be basing a few of our episodes on ideas from the old masters. Today we look into the teachings of Father Bartolomeo Bismandova. He was a wind player from Ferrara and he wrote a beautiful manuscript treatise uh, which is dated 1677 and has the name Compendio Musicale. This book sums up the basic music theory and counterpoint and it also includes instructions on how to play the cornetto and the recorder. Bismantova also offers a lot of practical tips for wind players, for example about instrument maintenance and about how to practice a new piece effectively. Let's try a few of those together. And we will demonstrate these exercises with a textless duet by Orlando di Lasso. And you will find a link to the free sheet music in the video description below. We are using Lasso's music, which is actually much earlier than Bismantova, just because the exercises we got inspiration for, uh, in this case, apply to general aspects of concert playing. They are not so specifically about late 17th century stylistic matters. One of Bismantova's advices is Practice first just the articulation without the instrument and add the fingers only later. And this is very clever advice. Absolutely. So we are going to try that with our piece of music. We are going to play just the articulations and blow with a soft articulation using the syllable that he recommends. De, 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 de. To make our musical ideas like dynamics or direction, we can also use a little bit more of our voice. Yes, let's repeat the previous exercise, but now let's hum the contour of the music. <laughs> Of course, you can also actually sing the notes and still use the same articulation. Day. It does not matter in which octave you are singing, it's all about the contour of the music. Yes, make it comfortable for yourself. We just did three variations of the same exercise, but you can even turn them into six variations by tapping your fingers on the instrument. Let's, for example, try this while humming the music. <laughs> So you can tap your instrument while articulating, while humming and while singing. After doing these exercises, go on playing the music as it's written and uh, focus on keeping the same ideas, the same phrasing, the same direction that you have discovered with the previous exercises. Thank you. 
Bismantova also gives two excellent tips on breathing. The first one is, if you need to play a long passage, let the air go out little by little and with good judgment. But how can you make sure that you let the air out little by little and with good judgment? Um, well, probably it has a lot to do with something we spoke about in episode 5. Check, for example, first of all, if the position of your throat, of your jaw, of your lips and of your cheeks is correct. Let's quickly try two different ways of playing and let's see which one is more economic. First, we are going to uh, relax our throat and our jaw and the cheeks and the lips as much as possible so that we create warm air and you can check this by blowing on your hand and check if the air is warm oh nice and warm let's play until we cannot anymore and let's also not take breath in any rest so that we can see if the test is working try the same thing again but using cold air so that means we uh, have a high position of the jaw we create a little bit of tension we think of a U embouchure and we create fast and cold air and we try again let's see if we get any farther <laughs> a lot. Check for yourself if you can save energy in your way of playing. Bismantova has a second tip about breathing and that is when you take breath do so in a way that nobody notices and for that purpose he recommends to take breath when there is a rest or after a dotted note. Our interpretation of the advice of Bismantova is that we should not disturb the musical flow of the phrase and the sound of the music. And we will show you now a couple of common examples of disturbing breathing. Rule number one, your breathing should be quiet, ergo not noisy. <sighs> when our throat is very tensed while inhaling. Let's try to really relax our throat uh, when breathing in, almost like yawning, like this. Like this it will almost not make any noise. And we, let's try to play the same passage once more with this feeling and also take into account how long your phrase has to be until the next rest so that we also don't take too much air in. the music is when uh, it affects the rhythm so there are some players that find it very difficult when they have a rest and they have to take breath at the same time to actually keep the beat and therefore they are either a little bit too early or a little bit too late after the rest and then you get these kind of problems <laughs> this problem let's replace the rest by a note with the same length as the rest and preferably the same pitch as the note you have to play next in the piece <laughs> So we uh, eliminate this repeated note and we replace it by a rest 
uh, but let's already play the new fingering when we play the rest. That will help us keep the rhythm. <laughs> can be really disturbing is when the sound quality of a note before the rest or after the rest is not exactly the same as the rest of the piece. For example, when we um, drop the pitch before a rest or when we underblow or overblow the tone after the rest. <laughs> aware of any habits of this kind is the first step to get rid of them and actually the most helpful thing you can do to start with is make sure that your tones are stable from beginning to end and that you stop every note by lifting the tongue against the palate in that way you will avoid the dropping for the tones after the rest avoid any unnecessary tension and move your tongue as small as possible, drawing a thin line for each and every note. So thank you, Mr. Bismantova, for your tips. And wisdom. And now on to our own 30, 30 seconds, seconds tip. We are the consort counselors, and you certainly know what a counselor is, but do you also know where the word consort actually comes from? Nowadays, we often use the word consort for ensembles with players that play the same instrument or different sizes from the same instrument. We speak of a recorder concert or a concert of vials or even of concert music when we speak about the music these ensembles play. Mostly 16th and 17th century music, that is. However, in the 16th and 17th century in England, the word consort meant more generally a group of musicians, and that could sometimes be a group of musicians playing the same instrument and sometimes a mixed ensemble. So in historical sources we find both meanings of the word. The origin of the word consort comes probably from the Italian concerto or the French concert. Originally all these words referred to a group of musicians. As concert counselors, we hope that our videos are useful for recorder concerts, but also for any other type of concert out there. Maybe even for the Prince concert. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to subscribe. And if you have questions or comments for us, contact, contact us here. here! See you next time! Bye bye!